I want to thank the organizers for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk at the workshop. And I'm just going to do an experiment and uh, see if I can walk away from this mic and you can still hear me. Can everybody still hear me? Is this going to be fine or do you want me to use the mic? Everybody good? Okay, cool, because I'll, I'll probably walk around. Okay, let's see. So uh, this is joint work with Sarah Tan, an intern who's a stat student at Cornell, uh, and Yin Liu, who was a Cornell grad student many years ago when this project started, uh, but has since moved on to, to other things. Uh, and Yin and I, despite the fact that we're different companies, we, we continue to work together every week. And then a number of other people, Johannes Gerke, some people from Microsoft, and some people from New York Presbyterian Hospital in Columbia. And then a cast of other people who have contributed one way or the other. So let's, let's just jump in. Whoops. OK. Imagine you've got data for a million patients. You've got thousands of great clinical features. Uh, you're good at machine learning. You train a state-of-the-art model. And you get an ROC that, you know, out of the, out of the roof, right? 0.95. You, you just do incredibly well. So you've got this model. And now the question is, you know, is it safe to deploy that model and use it on real people? Uh, is high accuracy on this test set sufficient to trust the model? Well, all you've really got, of course, is this black box, right? You know its I.O. behavior looks very accurate, but you don't know anything about what's going on inside the model. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to argue a little bit that you're never actually going to understand the data well enough, so that's a little bit contrary maybe to the theme of the workshop, but maybe we can understand the model trained on the data well enough that we can sort of then better understand the data and also edit the model if necessary. So that's where we're going to go. Um, so it's going to turn out that we have to somehow get an expert into this loop so that they can see what's in this model. And I'm going to show you examples of this, where, where if without the expert, we would actually kill people. So This is how I got involved. So this is way back at uh, CMU when I was doing my PhD in the mid-90s. Uh, I was involved in this pneumonia risk trial. So uh, everybody in the room, you have pneumonia. And our goal is just to figure out which of you are high risk and which of you are low risk. And if you're low risk, the best treatment really is uh, chicken soup, antibiotics, call us in three days if you're not feeling better. Going into the hospital is a bad place to be if you don't have to be there. But it turns out if you're high risk, you know, 10% of pneumonia patients die from it. If you're high risk, you absolutely have to be in the hospital or in the critical care facility. Now, one of our goals back then in the study was to compare the various machine learning methods that were available to us to see which one would be most accurate. And I got kind of lucky. I was working on multitask learning at the time. And it turned out the multitask neural net that I trained was the most accurate model that any of the teams working on this data set could, could train. So I sort of won the competition. And then there was a question, well, is it safe to go ahead and use this thing on real patients? And I said sort of, hell no. Uh, <laughs> we, we shouldn't trust this neural net on, on real patients because we don't understand it. Uh, and instead, we went ahead and used logistic regression, right? which is <laughs> the, the conservative model we've been using in this field for, for 50 plus years. So the question is, why do we do that? And it's the case study that's going to be interesting. Um, so uh, a friend who was doing rule-based learning at a different university on the same data set learned a rule one night, which is that if you have a history of asthma, you have less chance of dying from pneumonia, that asthma is somehow protective for pneumonia. Now, hopefully, that sounds a little weird, right? You, you don't have to be a doctor to question whether that makes sense. Uh, so we asked the doctors about this, and the doctor said, well, you know, it's probably a real pattern in the data. They said, you know, asthmatics presenting with pneumonia, we consider that very high risk. They get really aggressive treatment. And if you think about it, asthmatics are already paying attention to how they breathe. So they're probably noticing symptoms of pneumonia earlier than other patients would. Um, so they, they notice their symptoms earlier. They get worried earlier. They call the doctor earlier. They already have a doctor because they're asthmatics. The doctor takes it seriously when they're having trouble, trouble breathing. They get an appointment quickly, and then the doctor thinks they might have pneumonia, and they get really aggressive treatment because they consider asthma a very serious risk factor. So now all of these things, early noticing of symptoms, getting early treatment, and getting very aggressive treatment, are so effective for pneumonia patients because they get to antibiotics basically quicker. It's so effective that it actually does cut their probability of death compared to the rest of us who may not notice the symptoms so quickly or get to healthcare so quickly. So it is a true pattern in the data. The asthmatics actually are lower chance of death than the non-asthmatics. It doesn't mean asthma is good for you. It just means they're lower chance of death. Now, if the rule-based system learned this pattern, guaranteed my multitask neural net learned it as well. Right? We're all training on the same data, and it's a real pattern in the data. 
Um, but if we were to use this neural net, I didn't tell you the goal of our modeling was to build a system to help us decide who we should admit or not admit to the hospital. Right? So if we're going to field a model which thinks that asthmatics are lower risk, it will then predict that asthmatics maybe don't need to go to the hospital, the exact opposite of the high quality care they were receiving that made them safer than the general population. So now if I deploy this neural net, which probably has this in there, even though I can't see it, uh, we really could end up hurting asthmatics with, with this. Okay, now the key to discovering this problem was that somebody else trained something more intelligible than the neural net. They found this problem. And I told them, you know, now that I know there's this asthma problem, I probably could fix it and make it go away in the neural net. I said, what really scares me is not the asthma problem, it's what else did the neural net learn that's similarly risky, but the rule-based system didn't pick up on it, and therefore I don't know I have another problem to solve. And I said, that's why it's not safe to, to go ahead and deploy this neural net. So, so let's think about this for a little bit. It's always going to be risky to use data for some purpose other than which it was collected. So now the funny thing is in this, in this case, the study, the, the data really was collected for this was one of the purposes we collected the data for. But it turns out data is always going to have these landmines in it. So in this case, suppose what would be the perfect data for, for solving the asthma problem? Well, you'd send half of the asthmatics home and admit half of them to the hospital. Well, well, of course, we can't do that, right? That's not ethical. We would have to kill some asthmatics in order to make our machine learning model better. So, so we're not going to go ahead and do that. What that means is you will never have the right data that has all the information you need about what happens to asthmatics if you do or don't admit them to the hospital. You're, you're actually, Ill, it's illegal to have this data, you can't have it. You will never have it. That shouldn't stop us from going ahead and doing machine learning modeling, but it means we're gonna have to be able to sort of understand what the model has learned in order to be able to find these problems and then fix them before we deploy it. Because you'll never get the data you want. Now you might think, oh, well, we, if we had just understood the data well enough, we would have seen this problem in advance. But to see the problem in advance, you kind of, have to know that you're looking for this problem to begin with, right? There could be thousands of such problems in the data set. What are the chances that you, you know, will examine thousands of different things and find the seven that look wrong? It's actually very difficult. Our approach is gonna to be to look at the model that's trained on the data, and it seems like that's gonna be much easier than trying to understand the data. If you think about it, if you've got a thousand variables in a data set, there's at least a thousand different things you could try learning from that data. Understanding the data is like trying to understand all of those thousand things at the same time. We're doing something much easier. We, we're training a model to predict one thing, and we're just going to try to understand that model. So it, it turns out that's easier. To our surprise, once we look at this model, it does tell us all sorts of interesting things about the data. Although it only tells us things about the data that are probably relevant to, to the prediction problem at hand. It's critical in applications like healthcare, autonomous vehicles, nuclear power plants, things like that. It's just critical that experts are gonna be able to look at the models and sort of understand what's going on in them. Because now that we've been applying this kind of transparent modeling that I'm gonna show you to other data sets, every data set has these landmines. So in the past, I've deployed models that I thought were very accurate and I was comfortable deploying them. That was a mistake. It turns out every, every data set, every model is gonna have the problems I'm gonna show you. Same sort of story, by the way, if you're interested in race uh, bias, uh, gender bias, and things like that. So, so although I won't talk about that today. Um, the, only solution, the only solution we know of is gonna be to put the human somehow in the loop. The human's the only one who has the expertise to actually understand the model and be able to tell when it's doing something that is true in the data, but risky if we deploy it. So, so that's gonna be a hard thing to automate. Okay. So all we need to do to put humans in the driver's seat is we need a model that's sort of very accurate, because of course I want to use my most accurate machine learning methods, uh, but it's got to be very intelligible as well so that the human's in the, in the driver's seat and can see it. Now we have a problem, uh, which is that there's this trade-off usually, which is that the, uh, the most accurate methods, um, uh, things like boosted trees, random forests, and neural nets, you know, unfortunately tend to be low in intelligibility, and then we have models you know, like naive Bayes and logistic regression, which are less accurate, but they're very intelligible. So what we really want is sort of some, some magic model sitting in this upper right-hand corner. We want something that's sort of have our cake and eat it too, high accuracy and high intelligibility. 
To our surprise, we've made some progress in developing a model that sits in that corner of the space. OK, so let me tell you how we got there. So this is the space of linear models. This is just a weight times a feature plus a weight times a feature. Everybody knows regression. And then this is full complexity models, just some function of all your features. That's random forests and deep neural nets and boosted trees, all those sorts of things. There is a class of models in between, and these are additive models. So instead of being a weight times a feature, it's a function of a feature plus a function of a feature, just an additive sum of those functions. And then there's a more rich set of these things. This sum over all functions of single features is that. Here's a sum over all pairs of features, functions of pairs of features. Here's a sum over all triples of features. So this allows the model to capture uh, pairwise interactions and three-way interactions. We're going to just restrict ourselves to functions of individual features and a small number of functions of pairs of features. And we're going to restrict ourselves to that class because it remains intelligible. And then we're going to do everything we can to get high accuracy out of this class of models. And to our surprise, it works pretty well. Now, we didn't invent these. These are what's known as generalized additive models. Our uh, friends in statistics invented them in the late 80s. These have been around a long, long time. Uh, what we're basically going to do is we're going to make these things have an accuracy they were never able to achieve. And we're going to do that by using machine learning techniques and computer horsepower, things that they didn't have available to them in the late 80s. So, so that's where we're going. OK. Even though this is a computer science audience, I'm actually going to sp skip all the technical details of the algorithm. Feel free to grab me later or ask questions. I want to jump in and show you the kinds of interpretation you can make of these models and what it can tell us about the data. So I think that's more interesting. OK, so here's a pneumonia data set. I got permission after we developed these models about three years ago to go back and reuse this pneumonia data set from the mid-90s. It's real data, so I had to get permission. About 15,000 patients back then. That was a large data set. Nowadays, it's not as, as large. Um, and what's going to happen is here's some of the features. So we have things like your respiration rate, your heart rate, body temperature, uh, level of things in your blood, stuff, stuff like that. Uh, there's 46 variables in the data set. And what we're going to do is we're going to end up with you know, a function of variable 1 plus a function of variable 2 for 46 variables. And then we're going to allow 10 pairs in the model, 10 pairs of these things to capture important pairwise interactions. So we're going to end up with 46 plus 10, 56 terms in the model. Okay? And I'm just going to jump and show you the first of these terms. And we're going to spend some time looking at age, what the model has learned from age. Okay, so we're going to spend five minutes on this graph. So this is age. People in the study were from 18 to a little over 100. This is a density of people. So you can see most people were between sort of 60 and 90, as you might expect. Uh, this is risk. The higher the risk score, the worse off you are. So it's like log odds. If you were to have plus one, it would kind of double your probability of death. A minus one would be great. It would cut your probability of death in half. OK, and the way you use this model is you find your age in the model. Let's imagine uh, I'm 70. You read it. You get a zero. You write down zero. Then you go to the blood pressure graph, you find your blood pressure, you read it, it says uh, minus 0.3, write down minus 0.3. You go to the body temperature graph, you read your fever, it says, oh, plus 0.6, you add plus 0.6. Add all those numbers together, 1 over 1 even minus x squared, you got a probability. So it really is a form of logistic regression on steroids. Okay, so that's the way to think of it. Let's look at what it's learned. It's good to be young, and the model thinks that young you know, starts or ends at about 50, right? It doesn't really distinguish between people who are in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. So everybody who's below 50, as far as the model is concerned, for pneumonia risk, it seems to be young. Okay, so that, that's interesting. Interesting especially that it happens at about 50. Risk rises slowly as you go from 50s into 60s. Okay, so that, that's good. It doesn't rise too fast. There's an interesting jump in risk that happens at about 66, 67, 68. That would have been retirement age back in the mid-90s when the data was collected. So this is sort of detecting by accident that something happens to people at about this age. We happen to know it's retirement. Sad news is that retirement apparently makes you higher risk as opposed to lower risk, which, which is unfortunate. You might have hoped it would be the other way around. Uh, so you don't really want to retire if you're going to get pneumonia. Uh, 
Um, <laughs> and there's lots of reasons why that could happen, right? Your daily activity might change, your interaction with people might change, maybe you're suddenly taking the vacation of a lifetime and getting stuck in the Himalayas. Uh, your insurance provider in the US would change. Lo lots of things change there. So, so it's not surprising to see some impact of retirement on, on risk. Then risk continues to rise you know, fairly steeply as you go through your 70s and into your 80s. And then there's two more interesting, three more interesting things. There's a jump in risk at about 85. Risk is surprisingly flat, actually, when you're in your upper 80s and 90s. And then there's a drop in risk. Even though the error bars are, are big, it turns out this is probably real. There's a drop in risk at like 100, 101. OK, so let's, let's think about those. So a little, little weird, right? Whenever you see jumps in these graphs that happen at round numbers, you should you should question what's going on. We're pretty sure, that the doctors assure us that there is no reason why 86-year-olds are treated differently than 84-year-olds, except for one. Purely social convention, back in the mid-90s, 86, upper 80s was considered pretty old. And we think it's purely, the doctors think this is purely a social convention, like grandpa's 87. Grandpa's very sick, has had two rounds of antibiotics. He's got other problems. Perhaps we should stop fighting so hard and let grandpa pass, right? And that decision could be made by doctors. It could be made by grandpa. It could be made by a spouse. And it could be made by children, right? But we think we're seeing a signature of just a sort of conventional wisdom that, you know, upper 80s back then was, was pretty old. And lower 80s wasn't quite that old. Otherwise, it's really hard to explain this sort of round number effect. Um, so now, of course, today the you know 95 is the new 85, right? So, so so this thing would probably happen at a different place in modern data, and in fact, it does. When I look at newer healthcare data, we see a shift in this this sort of thing. But back then, we think it's a social effect. Okay. Surprisingly, we think this drop in risk at 101 is also a social effect. Christos. You've made it to 101. We're going for it. We're going. We're going to 102. We're 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 gonna. <laughs> so your, your sample size at the bottom is so low. The sample size is small, but there are enough people out here that this seems to be real. It's it's a great question, by the way, and we also see the same effect at exactly 100, 101 in other medical data sets. It sort of recurs generally. Yeah. So so it's because of that that we believe it. When I first saw the error bars and saw it, I thought, oh, it's probably not real. Is that filtering out all the the parents and grandparents and people that said, I give up all that remain are the fighters? Uh, well, I mean, there are people who might decide to give up at 101 and who haven't had pneumonia before. So, so nobody's filtered out unless they happen to have died earlier from this or something else. So there's, there's no filtering. It really just seems to be this weird effect of, we're going to go for it. And it could be the patient making this decision. It's possible it's a spouse, though that's less likely. It could be the doctor, or it could be children, or in this case, even grandchildren, you know, sort of, sort of deciding, let, let, let's not give up. Let, let's go for 102. Right? It could be the patient deciding that they're going to behave even better. Uh, it could be that they're just paying more attention now. Uh, so, so we don't really know the detail of how the decision gets made. But we do see the signature, the, the effect of that kind of decision. And we can't find any other effect in healthcare that sort of explains it, especially when it happens at these funny round numbers, like 85 and 101. You know, that's what really makes it jump out at you. And then this level, level is kind of a surprise. And we think this is what David Heckerman told me is called successful agers. It's people who have a pretty good genetic mix. They happen to not fall. They don't succumb to some of the the things that kill other people when they're old. They, they, they're good from, from a cancer point of view. They're good from a heart disease point of view. You know, they're good from a diabetes point of view. So, so risk is just surprisingly flat out here. And that, that's kind of interesting to know. OK, some interesting things about this graph. This model, which has 46 plus 10 of these graphs. Sure. Ah, so what you do is for every patient, you find their age, you read up, and then you read off the score. So a person who's 60, you would read a minus 2. You'll get 56 numbers like this, and you just add them all up. And the more positive it is, the higher the risk. The more negative it is, the lower the risk. And it's easy to convert it to a probability. I'm sorry, the green is just error bars. The red is the curve that we're looking at. I'm sorry, I should have explained that. 
So, so you find your age, wherever you happen to be. I'll, I'll say you're 30. Uh, and then you uh, end up being a minus 0.3 almost. And that would be your score from an age point of view. But then you're going to have 56 such scores. We'll add them all up. Okay. I think your question is about the density graph. So it's unrelated. This, this is just uh, what percentage of people have different ages. So most people are between age 60 and 90. This is just a histogram of, of ages. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, you can ignore this for now. This is the graph that we're trying to, this is the graph the model has learned to predict risk. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you for the help. But you're not doing anything with interaction effects? Uh, like not in this graph. Versus, that versus gender? Uh, I'll be there in a second. I'll show you an interaction in, in a few, few graphs. A yeah. couple interesting things about this graph. Um, first of all, if we're going to use the graph to help admit patients to the hospital, well, we need to fix this. We don't want the model to think that patients who are 102 are lower risk than patients who are 95. Right, right? I mean, no, nobody believes that's a true thing in healthcare. So we have to fix this. Risk at a minimum has to go level or maybe even continue to slope up, right? So we have some monotonicity expectation of risk with a function of age, at least for this particular disease. That's not true of all diseases, but for this one it is. This is interesting. We might want to tell doctors and patients, you know, don't give up so easily, <laughs> fight, fight longer, because when you give up, it actually does make a difference. It, it increases your risk. And this sort of says, you know, it would be nice if we had a separate variable which captured whether people were retired or not in the data set, because otherwise we're capturing it in age. And if we were to add a, a retirement variable, you know, some people retire earlier, some people retire later, we would capture all of that information about retirement on a separate variable, and then we wouldn't see this jump in risk at age because it would be captured by a different variable in the model. So those are some things to know. Here's another thing that's interesting. I've said we want to at a minimum fix this in the model before we use it to admit patients. Suppose instead we're an insurance provider so in our interest is actuarial. We're interested in you know, what percentage of patients survive because we have to have the funds for those patients and for their health care now and in the future. So that's a very different thing than predicting who to admit to the hospital. It turns out this model is actually just right for that. So the fact that patients who are 103 have lower risk than patients who are 97, given the way health care currently happens, is something from an actuarial point of view you'd want to know. This model is right and does not need to be fixed. Okay, it only needs to be fixed if we're going to use it to help decide who to admit to the hospital. So what's that tell us? First of all, the source of this problem is in the data. Okay. Machine learning didn't make a mistake. The problem's in the data. The model is not, the data is not in itself right or wrong. The model is not in itself right or wrong. It's only when you know what you're going to do with the model that you can start interpreting whether this model is correct or incorrect or has problems or not. So, so that's a critical, critical thing. Okay. So now this is the model. This is the model we were just looking at for risk as a function of age. This is what statisticians would have learned using their standard package. They would have done a much smoother fit to this data. And they would basically have a model which says that, you know, as you get older, your risk increases linearly. That, that's the, the fit statisticians would have liked. It's too smooth of a fit. It misses all the interesting detail that we're talking about this model. OK? There's one other thing about this model. There's 56 of these graphs. What I didn't tell you is this model is just as accurate as the neural net or anything else we know how to train in the data. So here's a model where we're talking about all these nuances, you know, where, where the separation between young and older is, retirement effects, risk as a function of getting older, some weird social effect, another weird social effect, maybe the effect of successful agers. All that nuance, I assume it's in the neural net that I trained years ago on this data. But I don't know where it is. It's hard for me to find that in the neural net. This model really is this graph, by the way. The, the, the model can be 56 pieces of paper. You really do just find the patient's age, write down a number, do that on all 56 graphs, add the numbers together. That, that is the model. This is not a proxy for some other thing that's more complicated. Even though millions of trees were killed in the process of making this model, we throw all those trees away. Uh, and the, graph is, the graphs are the model. This model is as accurate as anything else we can train on the data. There's no loss in accuracy, but there's a huge gain in interpretability and transparency. So, so that's the exciting thing. And what statisticians would have done isn't as accurate because it's too smooth. 
So you really prefer this model to this because of the high accuracy. And I would say even from a, an interpretability point of view, you prefer this model. This model is much more interesting. It tells us much more than this does. OK, so we have made some progress. OK, so some of the things it learned, well, the, you know, being 105 is better than being 95. Uh, we should have retirement. Right? The goal is to get to 105 without going through retirement or 85. I, I mean, you know. Um, it learned that asthma lowers risk. Remember, that's where we started. I was hoping it would learn that, because that's a real pattern in the data. Sure enough, it learned it. It also learned two things very important that the rule-based system never learned. It learned that having a history of heart disease and a history of chest pain are also good for you, just like asthma. So it turns out if you have a history of, of a heart disease and you suddenly notice you're having trouble breathing, you call the doctor really, really fast, even faster than the asthmatic does. The doctor takes it very seriously when you call, probably sends you to the ER. You get admitted to the hospital and diagnosed with pneumonia incredibly quickly, and you receive great, great care. It turns out the history of heart disease is an even bigger effect than the, the benefit of asthma. So in this model, has just sort of learned these things, and it's incredibly easy to see them. So you, you just look through the model, and, and you've got it. So it's good we didn't deploy this model back in the mid-90s. But I mean, the neural net model back in the mid-90s. But this model is so interpretable that we really could safely sort of look at the model, fix the few things that seem to be wrong with it, and, and then deploy it. So it's like having some magic pair of glasses. You, you know, you, uh, you've trained a model. The accuracy looks great. You think you're good to go. And you sort of put the glasses on. And you realize that every fifth person in the audience is some sort of space alien you, you know, uh, that needs to be fixed. So, so it's really like that. It's critical to understand that the model correctness depends completely on how you're going to use the model. The model is not right or wrong. And here's a surprising thing. You might think we could fix the uh, asthma, chest pain, and heart disease problem by just removing those variables. But because there's correlation between those variables and other variables, and because the problem is actually in the labels, it's true that heart disease patients have a lower risk. Because of that, the model will get its uh, asthma, chest pain, heart disease fix even if you remove those variables as much as it can through correlation with other variables. And then what will happen is you won't be able to see it. The effect will be spread among all the other variables. And it'll be harder to fix as well because it'll be spread among the other variables. So here's a surprising thing. Take the features you're most afraid of that you think the model will make the biggest mistakes with. Absolutely include them in the model. And then afterwards, you can see what it has learned from these variables. And you can have a better chance of repairing it. And we're going to talk about repairs. So pairwise interactions, everybody knows parity, pairwise interactions. right? It's things where you can't do a function of this plus a function of that. You actually have to function of the two things together. right? Parity, if you look at either of the features individually, you get no information. But if you know both features at the same time, you get perfect information. OK. Here's one of the interactions. There's 10 interactions in the model. This one is kind of sad. This is age on the vertical axis. And this is no cancer has cancer on this axis. So that's a Boolean. And the most interesting thing here is yellow is high risk at 0.5. And surprisingly, there's this yellow bar right here for people who have cancer but are very young, age 18 to 22. Uh, it is, leukemia is one of them, yes, yes. So what happens is, you're, you're exactly right. These are basically cancers of patients who had cancer when they're teenagers, probably. They've been very aggressively treated. Unfortunately, they're not considered to be in remission. So they're in the right side as opposed to the left side. They're not considered to be cured of their cancer yet. OK, so these are patients, childhood cancers. They've been incredibly aggressively treated. They're still considered to have cancer. And now if they're in the study, it means they have pneumonia. So sort of, you know, the shit's hitting the fan for, for some of these patients. They're, they're very sick. And the model says, you know, I can't just look at age, because age says young people are very low risk. And I can't just look at cancer. It, it thinks that having cancer is bad, by the way. It, you know, cancer adds significantly to your risk. But this says there's a special group of very young cancer patients who need to have additional risk added to them. And that's the interaction effect. Now, remember, that age model is still in the, in the uh, that age graph is still in the model. And the uh, cancer graph, which you haven't seen, is in the model. This is things that those two things separately couldn't, couldn't get that needs to be done through an interaction. OK. So that's uh, what a main effect looks like, and that's what an interaction looks like.
Now, let me tell you about work that I think fits even better with this workshop, which is work that we're doing now, um, which is what can we do to make these GA2Ms more intelligible? And later I'll talk about what can we do to make this, these models more editable. So now I'm going to mention briefly what overparameterization means. Overparameterization gives us some options. Like maybe we can then work on smoothness, sparsity, monotonicity, things like this. Maybe we can make the models more causal. Uh, you know, it's believed that more causal models are actually easier to understand usually. So, so maybe we can make progress on some of these things. I don't have results on all of them, but I'll, sh I'll show you some of the results. But first, let me tell you what overparameterization is. Whoops. OK. All right. So if you have a main effect that has, say, age, and you have a pairwise interaction that has age and cancer, it turns out the model is now overparameterized with respect to age. So what is overparameterization? Suppose we've got y is a times x1 plus b times x1, the very same x1. That's meant to be the same x1. Now, there's a lot of ways to set a and b so that you get the same model, right? Because you can rewrite this as y is a plus b times x1. And now anything that keeps a plus b constant you know, gives you the same model. right? So for example, if you wanted to do uh, 10 times x1, well, we could set a to 10 and b to 0. We could set a to 5 and b to 5. We could set a equal to 100 and b to minus 90. Right? There's an infinite number of ways to achieve the same model. So that's what overparameterization is. It means there are many ways to set the parameters and not change the model. Turns out there's a similar overparameterization between a main effect and the interactions that have that same main in it. So let, let, let me show you one of those. Um, so this is a graph you've seen before. This is risk as a function of age. And this is the interaction of age with cancer. We've also seen that interaction before. So nothing new there. Suppose we want to move mass from this graph into this graph. It turns out it's possible. There's an overparameterization on age here. We can sort of flatten this if we increase the risk here to compensate. So pick some age like above 80, we're going to drop minus uh, 0.5. Then above 80 in this graph, we would just have to increase risk 0.5 to compensate. So and it turns out we can do that all the way. We can make this age graph be completely flat. And if we do that, we end up with an interaction term that looks like this. Looks like this. This is our new interaction of age with cancer. And now our age graph is completely flat. You can remove it from the model. It doesn't do anything. OK, so that's what overparameterization can do. Now it turns out age has three different interactions. We could actually do this for each of those interactions. We could, we could put all this mass into one of the other interactions and not change this one at all. We could spread the mass equally among all three. We could put we could put 100x of this mass into this one and then put minus 100x of it spread among the other two. We can do a lot of complicated things. And all of those things don't change the model at all. But we're pretty sure that this is more interpretable than this. These are difficult to interpret. That's really easy to interpret. And we don't think the benefit, I mean, we do get rid of this term, right? The model now has one fewer graph in it. But we think those graphs aren't as easy to understand. So we actually think it's beneficial to have as much of the effect as possible in the main. And then the, uh, the interactions just cap capture the residual. So, so we think that's actually good. Um, so as I said, if the main's involved in more than one interaction, realize there's just many ways to move this around. So, and you don't necessarily want people playing with the model this way, like hiding mass here, pushing it somewhere else where it might not be noticed. So, so you don't really don't want to do that. Um, interesting thing, though, even though I don't think we want to do what I just showed you, this overparameterization, this mass moving kind of thing, still gives us other interesting opportunities that have to do with things like smoothness, sparsity, and monotonicity. So, so let's jump to those. So let's look at smoothness first. Whoops. OK. Again, these are the graphs you've seen before. Those are the original graphs in the model. Here's a smoother version of the risk as a function of age. It's more like a sigmoid. right? It doesn't have this jump. It doesn't have this drop. It doesn't have quite the same rise there. It's just a smoother version of the other, the other graph. It turns out we can achieve this without changing the model at all. And if we do that, we have to push some of the mass. Like here, we, we uh, increase the prediction. So that means for patients who are above 100 in this part of the graph, we have to decrease the prediction. So it becomes more black and dark, dark red. It moves down on this scale. 
Here we've uh, increased the prediction for people who are, say, 75 to 85. So in that region of the graph, we have to decrease in order to compensate. But you can see that we can do these compensations. So any change we make to this red curve to create something else like that green curve, we can, we can achieve that by, by making a corresponding inverse change in the interaction or in one of the interactions. Now, I don't think this is a win either. I think we've lost two things. Remember, I, you know, I didn't like the statistician, statistician's simple model, which was linear regression. I said it was too smooth. I think this is too smooth as well. So I think this original red curve is actually better. Uh, and it has made this more complicated. So I don't think this is progress either. But just keep this in the back of your mind that smoothness is one of the things that we could achieve. We could achieve either smoothness in an interaction or smoothness in a main or in multiple mains, multiple interactions. It's something we can optimize without in any way changing the accuracy of the model. Its predictions remain, remain unchanged. OK. It's interesting that this smoothness just happened by accident to create monotonicity. OK, it just happened to create a situation where risk didn't come down. Now, we weren't aiming for that when we did smoothness, but it does happen to do it. It's not clear that that's a good thing, though, because in this case, it created the opposite effect down here, hidden in this interaction. So it's not like we got monotonicity and suddenly the model is fixed. The model is still as broken as it ever was. It's just that it sort of hid the, the, the brokenness into this other thing. So we have to be careful about using some of these tools. OK. Let's talk a little bit about sparsity, and then, then I'll, start and I'll stop and start to wrap up. OK, so again, these are the original two graphs that we've seen before. Suppose we now ask the model if it can be sparse on an interaction. OK, things like sparsity, smoothness, monotonicity, those are things we could ask for of a main effect. We could ask it for an interaction. We could ask it for all interactions, all main effects. We can apply this any way we want. So here I've just asked it to be in this particular interaction. And I think you can see we've ended up with a very smooth, sparse model here. Uh, sparse basically means lots of zeros. And this, almost this whole left side is zeros. So, so it has achieved sparsity. Okay? And it achieved that sparsity by causing a change to the main effects. So I mean, it has to go somewhere. right? If you're going to change, if you're going to change this interaction, then somehow you have to take in it one of the terms in the interaction, and you have to move mass to it if you're not going to change the predictions. So what it's done is it's gone from the red curve to the green curve. So it's sort of amplified some of the effects. It hasn't changed where they happen. It just sort of amplified them. There's some extra noise here, which is kind of interesting. I don't know exactly what's happening here. I suspect this is some sort of complexity that has to do with cancer. Remember that cancer was lowering risk for patients who were 18 to, say, 22. And now this graph is so smooth, it doesn't capture that anymore. So I think what it's done is it's created a compensation now here in the age graph. So, so again, in this case, it's not clear if this is a win. right? We've gotten more interpretability of this, perhaps at the expense of some complexity there. But it's yet another tool that we have in our, in our toolkit when playing with these models. And once again, the sparsity thing is not changing the predictions in any way. It's just the fact that the model's over-parameterized. A human could sit there, or a different optimization procedure would perhaps yield a different model. And it would yield the same predictions. One interesting thing. When I did smoothness, it turns out I had to add some optimization criterion to other things. Like uh, if I was going to go for smoothness on a main, then I had to have smoothness or sparsity or monotonicity as a requirement on an interaction. Otherwise, what will happen is, It'll just say, oh, the best way to make the main smooth is make it all zero, and it'll move all the mass to the interactions, which, of course, it can do any time it wants to because it doesn't change the model. So if I really want to maintain some sort of interpretability in the main effect, like smoothness or sparsity or monotonicity, then I'm going to have to put some other counterbalancing uh, requirement on the interactions that are interactions as associated with that main effect. Or else it'll just do the simplest thing, which is it'll just move everything out of the main and move it into the interactions, which it can always do. But which we, we're pretty sure we never want that to happen. OK, so, so you have to have these counterbalancing things. But if we do something like sparsity or smoothness in an interaction, it turns out we don't have to have a counterbalancing effect on the mains. And the reason why is the whole idea is an interaction is capturing something that couldn't be captured by the mains alone. Right? The, the interaction is capturing something where you had to know both variables at the same time. There was no function of variable 1 plus variable 2 that, that could achieve 
this part of the model. So it turns out when we're going backwards from an interaction to a main effect, we don't have to create these counterbalancing constraints if we don't want to, because in fact it's not possible for the model to move all of the mass out of the, uh, out of the interaction. And in fact, uh, if you look at this graph, Right, an even smoother version of this graph would have been to have just completely uniform prediction for both cancer and no cancer. It turns out it's, it's not able to do it. It has to have some difference still here because there is a genuine interaction effect and it just has to model it. So, so it's just something to keep in mind that there are constraints on the constraints and how you would go ahead and use them. Right, so it's, it's getting complicated. And for your sparsity, yeah. are you using equal range bins or equal frequency bins? Ah, oh, it's, 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 it's a great question. There are different ways of doing sparsity. And one of our definitions of sparsity is just uh, the more terms that are zero in the graph, the better. That's the one I'm showing you here. But there are definitely other definitions for sparsity you might want to use. Okay. Um, and for smoothness as well, there's like some people in statistics do smoothness vertically or horizontally, but they don't do a corner wise kind of smoothness, a diagonal smoothness. Uh, so, so there are different ways to define these things, as you're suggesting, and they all yield different effects. Yeah. And there was a question back there. Yeah. Uh, it's a it's a really good question. So, two answers to that question. Yes. And no. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, <laughs> OK, so uh, yes, what's interesting about mass moving is you can do what if kind of questions. You could say, if I hadn't allowed this interaction in the model, where would that predictive mass have had to move elsewhere in the model in order to achieve similar accuracy? So it's very interesting from that point of view. But if an expert looks at this and says, oh, that's wrong, as in like asthma, chest pain, and heart disease don't lower risk, and they want to edit the model, which we'll talk about in a second, it turns out it's not a good fix for that. And it's not a good fix for that because it doesn't change the model's predictions in any way. It just sort of hides the mass somewhere else in the model where maybe it doesn't look as offensive. And that would be a terrible thing to do. We never want to give people the uh, power to hide things in their model that a regulatory agency you know, might not want or something like that. So, so we have to be very careful how we wield, wield these tools. OK, so now I'd love to talk about these things, but actually I don't have any results on these right now that I can show you. We, we are working on them. Um, I mean, regularization feature selection, it's pretty much as you would expect, although this can be combined with mass moving in an interesting way. Um, this trade-off between simplicity and intelligibility, if we allow the model to actually get a little bit less accurate, we actually can make some of these terms simpler. Uh, and then the accuracy will go down a little bit, and maybe the intelligibility or editability will go up. We haven't started playing those games yet. We're still focusing on changes we can make to the model that are uh, accuracy neutral. But, but ultimately, you might want to do this. Um, and then causality, of course, that would be the, the, you know, you know, the golden prize. Um, but it's a very hard thing to do. We are seeing, though, that these models tend to detect the signature of causal things more so than some other models we've worked with. And we think it's because they're so simple. Right? They, they almost don't have a choice. It's not that they're causal. They're not causal in any way. They're just correlation learning. But they do seem to show things in graphs that just sort of scream out for some sort of simple causal explanation. OK. Smoothness, sparsity, monotonicity, simplicity, L1 regularization. The problem is, you know, in machine learning, we're, we're all about well-defined criteria like accuracy, and we just optimize for them. That's what machine learning is, right? It's a criteria, <laughs> a model, and optimization. Now, we don't really have criteria for this. Um, now, each term in the model, you could say, oh, I want this term to be sparse. I want this term to be uh, monotonic and smooth. I want this term to have this property. Right? You can do this for every term. And there's hundreds or thousands of terms in the model. So there's a really complex way in which you could apply these sorts of tools uh, to the model. And we have no idea. Like the goal would be to create sort of interpretability of the model or editability. We have no idea how to define yet interpretability or editability. So we don't really know how to do this optimization automatically. So because of that, we think the only way to do it is to have a human in the loop and to have the human explore the space 
And it turns out they will, you do better understand what the model has learned when you start playing with these tools. Like when you ask it to suddenly be monotonic, uh, then you see where the mass moves and it sort of tells you what variables are correlated and linked together. So, so it is interesting, but it's very early days. So we need a lot of help with, with how to do this. Let me talk just a little bit about making the models more editable, which is different than making them more interpretable. Re remember in the case of a model that thinks asthma is good for you, heart disease, chest pain are good for you, and being 105 is good for you, we have to edit all those things before we deploy the model. Otherwise, the worst thing you could be is a 105 asthmatic heart disease patient, right? The model would say, oh, you know, go climb Mount Everest, you're fine, right? So, so, so we have to be able to edit the models. So it turns out one of the things we can do is centering. We've been doing that for a long time. And then I'll just briefly mention these other things. But let me tell you what centering is, because it's just very, very important. And we've been doing it already in all the graphs you've seen. So one interesting way to improve the modularity of these terms is the following. Suppose you've got some simple model, y equals mx plus b, right? Straight line. You can't change m or b without affecting the model, right? So you're stuck with mx plus b. Suppose though that your model is m times a graph of x plus b. Well, now it turns out you can play with things. Because in the graph, I could shift everything in the graph up 5. And then I could subtract 5 from b. And I get the same model. OK, so there's this extra degree of freedom, which is the vertical offset of each graph. We have 56 graphs in that pneumonia model. It's the vertical offset. And then I can move graphs up and down as much as I want, as long as I collect all the corresponding corrections into this intercept term. OK, so it turns out we do that. And what we do is uh, we take each term. So let's say risk as a function of asthma. Risk as a function of heart disease. OK, what we do is we shift each graph so that its average prediction over the patient population is exactly 0. That means, remember, the, the vertical height of the graph is just an arbitrary thing in the model, OK? We, we adjust the vertical height of the graph so that the average prediction is 0 for each term. Why do we do this? We do this because now I can remove a term and not introduce any overall bias in the prediction of the model. Suppose the term's average prediction was plus 1. Then if I remove that term, now all my predictions on average go down by plus 1. Now I'm predicting a lower risk for everybody. That would mean like the average patient's risk would have gone from 10% to 5%. That can't be right. So instead what I do is I center vertically all of the graphs. And that means that the average prediction is 0. If I remove the term, the average prediction with or without that term is still 0. And what I'm left with is the right base rate. And in fact, you could remove, if I do this for every graph, you can remove every graph. Now the average prediction from all of the terms is 0 plus b. b will be the base rate, and you'll still get the baseline correct probability. So it turns out this centering is an important tool that we're doing just to make editability. And the very specific kind of editability we're talking about is just so that you can say that term is in the model or out of the model. Because we often have things like asthma, chest disease, heart pain, where, where we just want to remove the term. OK, so, so that's one thing we've been doing for, for a long time. There are other things, though. If you're going to, if you're going to say that people who are 105 are higher risk than people who are 95, that's an edit to the graph, realize that the model will be less accurate on test data. Right? Test, test data really thinks that people who are 105 are lower risk, because in fact they are. But if you're going to use the model to admit people to the hospital, and we're going to fix that, then it turns out accuracy on the test data goes down. And in fact, if we remove uh, asthma, heart disease, chest pain, and the goodness of being 105, it turns out the accuracy goes down a fair amount for certain kinds of patients. So we'd love to have tools which somehow could be used in order to understand the impact of making those edits. You know, what kinds of patients are affected most by, by these changes. OK, now you might think, you might ask, well, could these edits be accomplished just by pushing mass around, right? Like maybe we could fix that 101 and higher risk by just sort of pushing the graph up and then moving mass. So no, that's cheating, OK? We don't want to do that because remember, moving mass is the kind of thing which keeps the model exactly the same. It just sort of pushes discriminative power from one term to another term. So, so we don't want to do that. And I'll just sort of show you. So here's an edit. 
The red is the original. Remember, it risk drops when you're over 100. If we just sort of flatten it off, that's the simplest change we might be willing to make, is that the risk doesn't go up, but it doesn't go down. It turns out if we do that, then it pushes. See how this is a darker blue band right up here at the top above 101? It turns out what it's done is it's pushed. We've increased the risk for those patients here. So it did a compensating decrease in risk here in the interaction. Wrong thing to do. So that's, that's cheating. So it's important to know what is legit and illegit to do with these different tools that we might give you. OK, so let me wrap up. What are the advantages for interactive data analysis of this kind of model? Well, first of all, I still think it's much easier to understand the model than to understand the data. We, we've been talking quite a bit about this model and what it's learned and how we would want to change it. And even though we're not experts in healthcare, I think it's a pretty easy discussion so far. So, so that's great. The model definitely tells you things you never expected to find. So, I mean, when people look for a bias in uh, data, usually they have an idea what bias they're looking for. They're looking for race bias or gender bias. You don't have to know what, I would never have thought to look for heart disease being good for you. Um, but the model just sort of kicks you in the face with that. So, so I think that's great. It's really good when your technique, whatever it is, your interactive data exploration technique, it's really good when that method just kicks you in the face with something. And then you sort of have to look there like dumbfounded and say, oh, what's causing that? And then figure it out. That, that's wonderful. Um, and you don't even have to design a statistical test to try to decide is this real or is this bias real or not real. The model sort of shows you and it shows you error bars and you have a, a pretty reasonable chance of just guessing whether it's real or not. So the trick really is you train the model, look at it, and it'll, it'll surprise you. In my experience, it surprises you every time. So the modularity of these models makes it easier to recognize problems. And then because it's modular, it also makes it easier to solve the problems, which is great. And then the beauty is these models are as accurate as anything else on many kinds of problems. So it's really nice to be working with a class that gives us both all this power of interpretability, but also gives us all the accuracy that we would have had of random forests or boosted trees or, or neural nets. Some comments. As I said before, these are not causal models, even though sometimes the graphs beg for causal explanation. It's up to us to do all the work. It's up to us to notice something in the graph that looks anomalous, and then to go ahead and figure out what's going on. The models are not causal. They do not solve the curse of dimensionality. If you've got 10,000 features, it's still going to be hard to look at 10,000 graphs. Um, correlation is from the devil. It's what really makes all of this, this hard, as, as all of you know. <laughs> um, these things are intelligible only if the features are intelligible. This is not a good model class for pixels or raw speech signals, you know, places where deep neural nets really do well. This is not a great, you know, a function of pixel one plus a function of pixel two plus a function of pixel three for 10,000 pixels. That's not going to be a very accurate model or a very intelligible model. While these things are not perfect yet, and we're doing lots of research on how to make them better, they are ready for prime time. Any place where you would use logistic regression, if you have continuous multi-valued variables, if you're all Booleans, the method is logistic regression. But if you have continuous va variables or multi-valued variables, you should be using this model instead of logistic regression. There's no disadvantage uh, compared to log logistic regression, and there's lots of advantages. Yeah. That's that's an interesting question. Th thank you for it. So the question is. The question is, uh, it looks like you would need a lot of data to fit this model. Surprisingly, you don't need that much data. And that's because the model class is incredibly restricted in its complexity. The fact that you're only allowing functions of individual features and then a few pairs into the model means you don't need anywhere near as much data as you would need if you're doing a full complexity model of all features at the same time. Now, you still need more data than you might need for logistic regression. But it turns out if you were trying to get logistic regression to work well on these problems, you'd have to create more complex variables anyway. And then suddenly you would need more data again. So it turns out, it's a, it's a great question. It turns out the data sample size complexity is not that high on this model class. So we've worked with data sets that have only a couple hundred positive cases in it. And we have multiple hundreds of features of dimensions, and it still does reasonable things. Yes, yeah, no, it's, a, it's a great question though. I'm, I'm glad you asked that, since I didn't mention it. Okay, um, whoops. And that's because you're just doing one way dimensions pretty much. A, I mean, a few hundred features. That's right. On one dimension, that'll fit. If you add too much 
the, any interaction direction. That, that, that's exactly right. If, if you included all pairwise interactions, of which there's order n squared, and if you include like all three-way interactions, of which there's order n cubed, then suddenly the model would get very complex, and you would need tons more data to do it. But instead, we have just the single main effects, and then a small number of pairs. Yeah, yeah. No, this is very good. Oh, I'm sorry? Oh, uh, we, we just do cross-validation. We, uh, we have an algorithm for finding the pairs and sorting them by their apparent importance to the model. And then we do the simple thing of try the first five, first 10, first 20, first 50, and do cross-validation to see where the knee and the curve is. Yeah, we, we have no magic technique for this. Uh, it, we do it for this model. Yes, yeah. I can talk to you more about that later, too, if you're interested. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yes. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. If you do some sort of PCA like dimensionality reduction, then you're going to lose probably the interpretability of these new features that you create. Um, and then I, I mean, you could still do this, and it might help you try to understand those new features, but that's a very hand wavy thing. I don't think it's going to be appropriate in those sorts of cases, even if it might work from an accuracy point of view. Um, we really count on the fact, I've applied this to data sets from hospitals that have 4,000 plus features in it. And it still works very well. And what we do there is we, you, you know, for each patient, we're able to find the 10 features that are most important for that patient. And it's amazing, I don't have time to show you this, it's amazing how informative and easy to understand the model is in that case. It's, it's like a trick with logistic regression where you sort terms by how much they contribute to your risk. We do exactly the same thing here, and it, and it really does, does work. So. And then the correlation. Cor correlation is just, I mean, I originally thought that uh, interaction was, was the nightmare, and now I realize, no, interaction is easy. It's correlation that's the nightmare. There's no easy solution to high dimensionality with the correlation that must come from high dimensional data. Um, this model does a pretty good job of separating things into separate graphs that are interpretable, but if you remove some of the features, add some new features, things shift around. It, you should never interpret these graphs like that risk as a function of age as being true. It's just a completely transparent version of what the model is doing. Uh, but it's not necessarily true. And because of correlation, if you added or subtracted other features, that, that graph would, like if we added the uh, retirement variable, the jump in risk that happens at sort of 67, 68, 69, that would go away because it would then be captured by another variable. So it's not that the models are correct. They're just completely <laughs> transparent and easier to edit. Yes. One last question. Sure. One of the causes or the problem is that your outcome is Absolutely. That's not included in your model. Absolutely. And it turns out, in this case, all of the patients who had asthma uh, were admitted to the hospital. I don't know how quickly they got to care, but they were admitted to the hospital. So it turns out we actually have no information about what would have happened to the asthmatics if they had not been admitted. Just adding the treatments, the interventions, uh, to the model would solve it and make it go away. And it turns out it, it doesn't in a surprising number of cases. And you're still stuck with this, this kind of problem. It's, it's a it's a very nasty thing. Uh, I would also have thought it would be easier to fix, but, it, but it's not. Yes. So, so we really need human expertise to say, oh, no, risk doesn't go down with asthma. In fact, I want risk to go up plus one with asthma or plus 10. I want every asthmatic in the hospital. It really takes a human expert to fix it in this case. And we, we know we will never have the right data set, at least not in the US, uh, to, to fix this problem. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting thing. I, th okay. I think one last question. Sure, sure, yeah. sure. Uh, you were talking about putting the user in a driver's seat. Yes. And nowadays, everyone wants driverless cars. So, <laughs> well, my question is, uh, that, uh, once the user sees that and sees some problems in this model, does the user want to work with you to fix it, or the doctor would be like, you know, there are some people right. from, like, you know, science, their models just don't work, and right. you know, let, me, let me do my job. So here's, oh, 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 I see. Oh, that, that's an interesting spin on it. So it turns out 
First of all, every data set you apply this to, in my experience, you will find these surprising things. So you'll find things that if you wanted to use the model, you really should fix them. And in fact, it's often the simplest cases that the model makes the biggest mistakes on because it's the simple cases that are un less documented. You don't have all the features because they're considered easy. And it's also the simple cases for which we already have interventions that are effective. So the model is actually most likely to hurt the people who are the easiest to, to treat. So that, that's one thing. The other thing is, though, there's no doubt that having these models would, would help healthcare. I mean, even doctors recognize this. The data is always going to have these landmines. You have to do something to be able to see these landmines. You need some magic glasses. That's what this workshop's all about. You've got to have some, some technique to be able to fix these problems. Otherwise, your model is going to make these really stupid mistakes. And then the whole field is at risk, at least in that domain, because people will have learned some very bad things. Like, why are all the asthmatics and heart disease patients dying? Right, that would be a, a terrible thing. So, and I just want to single out uh, Yin Lu, uh, happens to be here. Uh, Yin Lu was, the, was a grad student, who, uh, first, uh, a grad student from Cornell who first helped, helped me develop these models. Um, Yin and I have been working together you know, ever since. So, so good to see you. Well, I think we discussed about this for hours, but unfortunately our time is up. So let's thank uh, Richard.